In this, part two of Three Seasons in Shangri-La, we'll continue to explore some of the summer plants and then progress into the autumn. It's the longer of the two halves, as the timing of part one suggests I could relax my restrictions on plant numbers a bit. Please refer to part one for details of location, but for continuity, let's start where the last lecture finished, at Tianchi, Celestial Waters. The legends that surround Mandrake are well rehearsed. You can even find an article about it in the Harry Potter wiki, uh, with small amounts of truth in it. Mandragora coalescens is the Asian mandrake, and certainly looks sinister in the gloaming at Tianchi. Let's move on to another day and a slightly brighter light. The grassy slopes just rising from the plateau are also well worth exploring in the summer months. Uh, the large cerise pink flowers of Incavilia jongdianensi make it hard to place in the garden, but it does make a bold statement. Deep soils needed for the taproot, formerly known as Incavilia mariae var multifoliata, the fleshy but ferny leaves and the multiple inflorescences led Christopher Gray Wilson to separate it out from Maryi as a species in its own right in his 1998 New Plantsman article. As well as the deep magenta flowers, there are occasional specimens uh, with a lighter rosy pink colour. The Incavilia is quite abundant with some extensive colonies in places, but a wetter flush is needed for Aris bulliana. This is a slight smaller plant than the Siberian irises and better balanced for a damp border or pocket in a rock garden, perhaps. Aris ruthenica var nana, shown here, is smaller still and a delightful little plant. Uh, the varietal name does not seem to be recognised botanically, but it does seem to be the one in a variable and widespread species that is worth searching for horticulturally. So I've uh, kept to that and I think you'll find that referred to in uh, where it is available in nurseries. Staying with the embankments to the side of the plateau for the moment, uh, Mechanopsis pratii offers a sturdy if prickly blue poppy. It's a handsome monocarpic plant but a little tricky to grow and flower apparently even in Scotland. Another plant like the aforementioned Aris named for Arthur Bully of Bees Nursery fame is Androsaceae bulliana. It's scattered on a stony embankment. The scarlet flowers stand out more strongly than those of most Androsaceae. Uh, the scarlet flowers led Franche to name this Androsaceae coccinia, a denomination that predates that of the collection by George Forrest, and so is the now uh, accepted uh, specific name in Cues plants the world online. If you have been searching for Ramondas in the mountains of Europe and similar, uh, you'll want to peek into the steeper and shadier rocky spots. Here we find Coraladiscus lanuginosus in the same subfamily and tribe of Gesneriaceae as the Ramondas, is clearly recognizable as such by both its form and its habitat uh, preferences. The more you search the whole plateau, it just keeps on giving. Aris dolicosiphon, a uh, subspecies orientalis, was relatively uncommon, seeming to prefer drier open areas with little competition from other plants. The nominate subspecies is found from Bhutan to Tibet. Uh, the plants in the eastern Himalaya, Myanmar and south central China are attributable as here to uh, subspecies orientalis, so quite clearly geographically distinct uh, subspecies. There are some surprises too. Lurking in scrub edge, just as it tends to back in the UK, was greater butterfly or orchid Platanthra chlorantha. Uh, Q's Plants of the World Online gives its distribution extending from Europe to North Iran. However, here it is in the hills above Zhongdian, and indeed the orchid field guide by Kuhn, Pedersen and Cribb does mention that is also from, found from southwest Asia through uh, China to Tibet. So it is indeed a, a very extensively distributed plant. Continuing to travel north, there are some grazed meadows in the 3,800 to 4,000 meter altitude band with quantities of Incavilia grandiflora and the curious but characterful uh, Lilium lepophorum lantern-like flowers of the latter, a lightly scented of lemon, 
and eventually uh, burst open at the tips. Uh, this one needing a day or two more, though, to completely burst open. Given the altitude, it needs cool and damp, but well-drained conditions, but apparently is not as challenging as the similarly sized uh, Lilium sulii, which uh, we mentioned in part one. It would be a mistake to move on without a closer look at Incavillia grandiflora. It seems to be almost all flower, with the size of the flower perhaps exaggerated by the shortness of the stem and comparatively small size of the leaves at flowering time. Moving on a little higher, the meadows is around the 4,200 metre mark are well worthy of study. On rocky or bare ground, one can e occasionally find an interesting labiate, Lemia flomis rotata. The large shiny corrugated leaves are at an extreme end of a fairly typical labiate character, but the inflorescence tightly nested in the centre of the leaf rosette does make it quite uh, um, distinguished. There is plenty to be seen here, but the standout plant for many would be Omphalogramma vinciflorum. The periwinkle blue of the six-lobed corolla gives the plant its specific name, but it also excels in both shade and grace that the comparison does seem audacious. Uh, this one, in my mind, comes foremost. We'll come back to the Zhongdian Plateau in the autumn, but let's move on further north to higher altitudes. Further upstream, the gorge cut by the high reaches of the Jincha Jiang are in the rain shadow and quite arid. However, when the road takes a turn up to the west and heads up across the Yangtze Mekong Divide, the vegetation becomes much more lush with some wonderful rhododendron forest. Open wet flushes yield extensive mixed colonies of Primulus secundiflora and Sicumensis, beauty that lies too deep for tears, to reuse a phrase from the late Carl Sagan. The pass peaks at around 4,500 metres, with some tempting screes about two to 300 metres higher up. Time at this high point was very limited, unfortunately, but we can take a look at one little plant that is braving the tough conditions. Uh, Gagia, formula Lee, Lloydia, Flavo Newtans. Uh, don't be deceived by the uh, height of the picture. Use the, the leaves around, the small leaves around as a, as a sense of scale. It is a, a tiny little plant. On the west side of the pass, travelling down towards De Chen, uh, Primula sicimensis consorts with Primula zambalensis. There is an abundance of primulas in, whole, in this whole area, so singling out just one in the interest of space seems a bit harsh, but Primula zambalensis is well worthy of attention. The pale lilac flowers have a graceful sweep to the corolla. It can form quite large clumps, although a singleton, as here, really shows off the elegance of the plant. Plants of the world online only accept Primula zambulensis as a synonym for Primula gemifera var amina, although the former is the name used in the Grey Wilson and Crib Guide to the Flowers of Western China for the plants found in this area. Forgive me for sticking with the uh, uh, specific name zambulensis. I, as with so many plants, I think discussion will continue about this. At the end of July, the drying racks of the Zhongdian Plateau are still empty, but the weather can start to get a bit uncertain. Come the beginning of October, and the landscape is beginning to change dramatically. Napa High is now filling out to its full extent, and the higher meadows are flush with water. Rain comes and goes, but there are still enough sunny days to dry the harvest. The leaves of Euphorbia Jolkine have turned a flame red and the livestock is now down from the higher ground carefully grazing around the euphorbia shades of blue abound uh, this is the season for gentians and campanulaceae drifts of blue on the plateau in wet flushes amongst the euphorbias are provided amongst others by the spurred gentian halenia elliptica uh, up close it is indeed an attractive plant but in the garden it's perhaps best in a cluster, just as it's found here on the plateau. Not to be underestimated, it is an important plant in traditional Tibetan medicine with a range of biological and pharmaceutical activities. More recent work is showing it has the potential for treatment of acute and chronic hepatitis. Another smaller flowered member of the gentian family is Comastoma trailianum, growing quite widely in the damp meadows. It offers a paler version of gentian blue with an interesting effect from the fringe scales. 
uh, and the white style that almost fill the mouth of the Corolla. The little Chinese ladies' tress also seems to evade being browsed. Of the 50 species of Spiranthes, Spiranthes sinensis seems to be the only one that is found in the wild in China. Uh, despite the specific name, the alternative common name of Austral ladies' tresses is more descriptive of its distribution in the temperate grassland from China across to Japan and Australia. Just as a little si aside, and we'll come back to this when looking at the gentians, a recent paper in Phytotaxa on Spiranthes in Taiwan uh, mentions that to quote, the taxonomy of Spiranthi is highly challenging due to its phenotypic plasticity, morphological convergence, and hybridization. Uh, the article does, however, confirm sinensis as occurring in ta Taiwan, but we'll see that the challenge they mention is not just confined to orchids. A more robust autumn flowering orchid that seems to evade grazing as well is Ceterium nepalensi. This is perhaps an even stronger example of the danger of assigning specific names after a country where it is first recorded, as the distribution of Ceterium nepalensi extends widely across the Indian subcontinent, Southwest Asia and Central China. You might notice that there's a gentian that looks like it might be a Sinoornata type sneaking into the picture. We'll come back to that a little later. The blues of autumn are not just confined to Gentianaceae and Campanulaceae, however. Here we have Ranunculaceae feeling blue too. I have this in my notes as Delphinium coleopodum, but there are an awful lot of Delphinium, so please take this with an element of caution. However, little more confidence applies to Allium bezianum because, well, because you know it and grow it. Uh, it is indeed beautiful. But I said gentians and campanulas for the blues, so let's unwind a bit and come back to Campanulaceae. Codonopsis meleagris has elements of blue in its solitary flowers, although this is quite variable in the corolla that is predominantly greenish-white in a very distinctive and rather refined little plant. More of a campanula blue, but less campanulate in form, is Codonopsis convolvulaceae. Its climbing habit also contrasts with the previous plant, and indeed Q's Plants of the World Online places it in a different genus as Pseudocodon convolvulaceus, following the monograph of Professor Hong of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, so perhaps should be revised. Now let's get back to Gentianaceae, where we'll stay for the remainder of the lecture. Gentianopsis grandis is an annual or biennial that is a little bit easier to distinguish than some of the annual gentians, see later, noting especially the four-part flowers. However, it's on the higher ground that the gentians come into full force. Back to Tianchi in October, the snow is now flecking the ground and surface water is flowing freely through much of the meadowland. Here we find gentians, sino ornata and arethusi en masse. The joy and heartache of these larger Asiatic gentians is well known to all gardeners, and living in the south of England they're way out of my own experience. But to be amongst all of these at Tianchi in the autumn is very heaven. Gentian arethusi is found on dry ground. They're a little bit of a tease first thing, however a little bit of sun will encourage them to show off the tub shape of the corolla as they open their very tubular campanulate form. The sinoornata types seem to like a good inch of water. Uh, the narrowly campanulate corolla clearly distinguishes Gentiana sinoornata from Arethusi, but as you can see, they prefer quite different microhabitats and this perhaps shows the challenge of growing it if you can provide these conditions with uh, pure running water, presumably somewhat acidic uh, given the location, then you might be in for success. About 30 kilometres due east of the main town is Beta High, which is now firmly on the tourist trail. High means lake, so Beta High Lake, as it is referred to on so many websites, is a tautology. A walk up to it from the main car park, which is now complete with a hamburger restaurant, uh, takes you past wet flushes of Gentiana vitiorum. It doesn't seem to seek out the running water of Sinoornata, 
and the well-developed basal rosettes easily distinguished from, I hope, Sinoonata. However, the main course is the extensive wetland area on the western end of the lake. Here is a sea of Gentiana Sinoonata that must be hard to beat for spectacle. Although the wilderness character and diversity of flora of Chianchi scores just as highly, but in a different dimension. The colours shade from pale blue, almost white, to a deep blue. Christopher Gray Wilson and Philip Cribb's Guide to the Flowers of Western China illustrate the colour range quite well. You don't see it so much uh, in, in my pictures. Just to finish off, we'll head north again and then take the road from Benziland to Dechen that crosses the Yangtze-Mekong divide. Gentiana hexaphylla has the same tubular companionate corolla as Gentiana arethusi and only differs from it in what are to me quite subtle characters. However, the locations and preferred microhabitats do seem to be quite distinct. Gentiana georgii, in contrast, does stand out clearly from the others in section Kudoa. They are the Sinoenata types. Uh, the Kodachrome film I was using doesn't seem to have fully brought out the distinctly purplish colour of the flower, but the basal leaves uh, do seem to quite clearly distinguish it. The annual gentians, however, much smaller, can be harder to pin down to species level. This one is very similar to the one that has been identified respectively on a website in a calendar as Gentiana delavii and also as Gentiana shangri-la as a new species in the latter case. However, the herbarium specimens of Gentiana delavii is a quite different plant and I've been unable so far to find any formal description of Gentiana shangri-la. One might also note that recent research indicates that the common ancestor of Gentiana lived on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau around 35 million years ago, with a steady increase in diversification rates since then. The annual gentians in particular have experienced intense diversification, so one can perhaps be forgiven for experiencing some challenges and uncertainties here. Again, refer back to what I was saying about the spiranthes, that there is a, a, a big mix and a lot of careful study needed here. Just before I finish, it's well worth enjoying the view above De Chen across to the Mekong Salween Divide. The peaks of Mei Li, meaning mountains of herbs, are typically cloud covered. However, on this day, the clouds seem to be teasing us. The highest peak is Kawagabo, which rises to 6,740 metres. You can see it just beginning to peek out from behind the cloud to the right of centre in this picture. Will we be blessed with a rare, clear view? Ah, there it is, just over a thousand metres lower than Everest. It has an impressive rise of about 5,000 metres from the base of the Salween Valley up to its peak. So on the far side, it really is a, a massive rise. Uh, so far unconquered, uh, several attempts uh, led to failures and it's seen in, as a Tibetan sacred mountain and uh, agreement is now that it will be left unconquered. With that, we end a quick and highly selective review in an area that is remarkable for its biodiversity. Being able to have visited it over three seasons has given a stronger feel for the rich and diverse natural history uh, of the area, but this really has just scratched the surface. Nevertheless, I hope it emphasises the need for us all to work hard to safeguard our amazing and complex to quote the cos cosmologist Carl Sagan again, our moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. All this complexity arising out of sunlight and stardust. My thanks to so many people who led trips and offered help on identification uh, and so uh, many others on the various trips who, who helped. As always, failings and errors all my own, so please try and forgive them. And for goodness sake, don't use my identifications as definitive. Use uh, a trusty field guide and the online resources. Thank you.